Welcome to Achieving Your Goal, Toolset 2, Managing Procrastination. Having set your goal using the five-step technique described in the Goal Setting Toolset, and as you work towards achieving it, there's a good chance that you'll encounter procrastination. This toolset provides you with the tools that, used individually or in combination, can help you to manage yourself in a way that makes you more likely to achieve your goal. This toolset consists of this presentation, together with a prompt sheet for helping you to manage procrastination. Procrastination is the putting off, the delaying, of a task or tasks associated with completing your goal. In this presentation, we'll describe seven ways for you to manage and overcome any tendencies you may have towards procrastinating. According to Dr. Piers Steele, a researcher in motivation and procrastination, 95% of us have procrastinated, at least occasionally. The good news is that if you've used the process described in the Goal Setting Toolset to define and set your goal, you will already be using four inbuilt mechanisms for helping to avoid the procrastination that most of us are prone to. We'll learn what these mechanisms are in a moment. Here are seven different ways to overcome procrastination. Take small steps. Stop in the middle of what you're doing. Make it easy for yourself. Make yourself accountable. Counter a task's unpleasantness. Adapt your focus. And forgive yourself. One reason for procrastination is that the enormity of a goal can sometimes appear overwhelming and unmanageable. This is why the goal setting toolset breaks a goal down into sub goals and the sub goals into tasks. For example, writing a novel, some 60,000 words, can be overwhelming. Breaking the goal down into writing 300 words a day for 200 days makes the goal more manageable. But what happens when we need to sit ourselves down and spend the hour it takes to write those 300 words? If we choose to write in the evenings and we've had a long day at the office, an hour can feel like quite an investment, especially when we're tired what we really want to do is lounge in front of the television. In such situations, forget about the hour, what feels like a large step towards completing our task, and decide instead to spend five minutes or maybe 10 minutes writing and no more. You take a small step. When we do this, when we start our task and focus our attention on just doing, instead of the investment we need to make to complete it, we're more likely to continue taking other small steps until and before we know it, an hour and 300 words has passed. Have you ever heard a book being described as being unputdownable? The book is so good, its story so gripping, that the reader cannot stop themselves from reading one more chapter, because they want to know what happens next. This unputdownable behaviour is a consequence of our minds being compelled to remember a situation until it reaches a satisfactory conclusion. We can't let go of that thought until we experience an end or closure to the suspense we're feeling. This behaviour is called the Zygonik effect, which is named after the Russian psychologist Bluma Zygonik. We can apply this feeling of suspense to our goals and the tasks we need to complete. When we leave a task unfinished, we cannot forget it, which in turn creates the need to complete it. This need can help overcome any procrastination we may feel the next time we need to sit down and work on it. In a similar vein, if when you finish a task or a sub-goal, start working immediately on the next one, even if it's only for 5 or 10 minutes, so that you create suspense, that mental reminder, to complete it. One reason that 95% of us have procrastinated in some way or another is because we're wired to prefer instant gratification over deferred or delayed gratification especially when the consequences are not something that we have to immediately deal with. If at home you sit down in front of your computer to do some work, but instead you watch a couple of videos on YouTube and then check what's happening with your friends on Facebook, you've chosen instant gratification over the deferred gratification of having completed your work. Furthermore, and since you're at home, there's no immediate consequences such as your tutor, boss or customer being there to ask you what you're doing. Similarly, you're just about to go to the gym 
when you remember that your favourite TV programme is about to air. Since you don't want to miss it, you skip your gym session. Making it easy for yourself is about understanding what can distract us and then finding ways to remove the distraction so that we do not encounter it when working towards our goal. We only have so much willpower, so this approach helps us to conserve this limited resource for the task at hand. For example, if you're working on your computer at home and you don't need internet access, unplug your modem. This removes the opportunity for distraction. Alternatively, install a procrastination program on your computer that will prevent you from visiting certain sites while you're working. And if you don't want to miss your favourite TV program, make sure to record it so that you can watch it when you get back from the gym. Alternatively, choose a time, like early morning, when there are minimal distractions to prevent you from exercising. One step described in the goal setting toolset involves going public with our goal. Going public does two things. Firstly, it provides us with supporters, people who will help us when we face challenges and obstacles. And secondly, it makes us accountable to those same people. As mentioned earlier, it's much easier to procrastinate if there are no immediate consequences. The same goes for being accountable. If we're only accountable to ourselves, it's easier to find excuses or even lie to ourselves about why we haven't completed a task. If we have to choose between the instant gratification of a distraction and the delayed gratification of completing our task, the thought of having to explain to others why we're behind on our goal can make us less likely to procrastinate. The need to avoid the discomfort of another's disappointment in us is often greater than the instant gratification that the distraction provides. In addition to going public with your goal, using a visual cue, in this case a photograph, is another technique you can use for making yourself accountable to others. First, think of those family or friends who will directly or indirectly benefit from you completing your goal. For example, you've set yourself the goal of being healthier and one of the sub-goals is going for a run three times a week during your lunch break. One benefit of being healthier is that you won't feel so tired when you get home from work each evening and you'll have more energy at the weekends. This additional energy is something not only you enjoy, but your wife and two children can too. Rather than fall asleep on the sofa after dinner and when the children have gone to bed, you're able to give your wife more attention, perhaps reintroduce some romance into the relationship. And at the weekends, you're able to play with the children for longer and not feel so exhausted after. Now, you find a photograph of your family and keep it on your desk. Just before you go for your run, you take a look at the photograph and remind yourself of the benefits that they will enjoy because you're getting fitter. When one day, you feel like having a pub lunch with your work colleagues, instead of going for that run, you take a look at the photograph. The picture of your family reminds you of why you want to be healthy and fitter and how going to the pub on this particular running day will not help you and will not help them. The family photograph is a visual cue that provides a strong incentive to avoid the instant gratification of a pub lunch and instead work towards the delayed gratification of a happy home life. When we consider a task to be unpleasant or boring, we're more likely to procrastinate. In such circumstances, look for ways to counter the unpleasantness with something pleasant, a reward, or find a means of reducing the unpleasantness itself. Rewards. There's a reward step in the goal setting toolset which involves identifying something that you'll reward yourself with when you complete a sub goal. There's no reason why you can't do the same for a sub goal's task, especially when it's boring or unpleasant. Whatever the reward, make sure that it's proportional to the task you've completed. So for example, completing your morning's task of cold calling five strangers to see if they'd be interested in testing your latest product, you promise to buy yourself your favourite sandwich from the deli next door. Deciding instead to have lunch at the most expensive restaurant in town, where a meal costs more than you earn in a day, is not a reward that's proportional to the task. Reducing unpleasantness Reducing the unpleasantness of a task 
involves finding ways of completing a task while at the same time countering those things that we dislike about it. For instance, one solution that students use for reducing the unpleasantness of revising for an exam is to join a study group. Joining a study group is one way of countering the unpleasantness of revision with the socialising that studying with others brings. Boredom is a common reason for finding a task unpleasant. There are two ways of managing a boring task. Make it interesting or fun and focus on the outcome. Making a boring task interesting or fun involves only a little imagination. For instance, if our goal is to make our life tidier, but we find housework boring, we can make it more interesting by competing with ourselves or by being involved in something else while we do the housework. Competing with ourselves might involve timing how long it takes to clean the house without skipping the dusting or wiping down all the kitchen work surfaces. Focusing on being thorough, yet quicker, compared to the last time we cleaned the house, deflects our attention from what we have to do to how we do it. Being involved in something else while we clean the house might involve wearing headphones and listening to music or our favourite podcasts as we vacuum. Alternatively, we could use the time while we're dusting to call a friend. Focusing on the outcomes of a boring task involves thinking about the benefits we'll enjoy as a consequence of completing it. When the house is tidy and uncluttered, we feel more relaxed because we're no longer surrounded by those things that remind us of a job that needs doing. Every hour that we study brings us one step closer to gaining a qualification or increasing our knowledge. Focusing on the outcomes helps to remind us about why we need to complete the task. Breaking a goal down into its sub-goals and its sub-goals into tasks helps us make achieving it more manageable. Another reason for doing this is it helps provide us with both the big picture of what we're working to achieve and at the same time allows us to dive into the detail of what needs to be done. Knowing when to see the big picture and when to dive into the detail can help us to manage any tendencies we may have towards procrastinating. We're more likely to complete the tasks we've set ourselves when we give ourselves deadlines. Knowing when a sub-goal needs to be completed informs the deadlines of its various tasks. Sometimes, procrastination can be a consequence of not knowing where to start with a goal. When you set deadlines, knowing the detail behind when certain tasks need to be completed by can help overcome this problem, because we start on the task with the earliest due date. When faced with a challenge or task that contains risk, focus all of your attention on the task at hand. If you shift your focus and think of the big picture and consider the overall goal that you're working to achieve, you place considerable pressure on yourself and most likely increase any fear you're experiencing. For example, imagine you're a painter and your goal is to get an art gallery to show your work. One of your sub-goals is to paint a series of five paintings on a landscape theme that you know the gallery would be interested in. The problem is, the first of these five paintings is not working. You've tried different ways of creating the look and feel you want to portray, but so far, each one doesn't work. When you remind yourself that this is the first painting and that there are four more to complete, and that your deadline for approaching the gallery is in three months' time, you start telling yourself that you'll never make it and that you'll have nothing to show the gallery. The more you think this way, the harder it is to start your next attempt at completing that first painting. As you can see from the example, the problem gets worse as we shift our focus from the task, that first painting, to the sub-goal of completing all five paintings in three months' time, up to the goal itself of approaching the gallery. If we're to complete the first painting, we need to stay focused on the task at hand. If we focus on either the sub-goal or the goal, we reduce both our motivation and the energy we need to complete it. Shifting our focus from the details of a task to the overall goal we're working towards can help when we need to be persistent. Achieving certain goals requires the same task to be completed on a frequent and regular basis, such as exercising, studying 
or cleaning. These tasks require persistence, especially where there's a temptation to put off until tomorrow what can be done today. It's during these moments of temptation that we need to shift our focus from the task onto the goal and remind ourselves how completing the task at hand will bring us closer to achieving our goal. So the previous example of going for a run during our lunchtime or having a pub lunch with work colleagues involves shifting our attention from the task, going for a run, and focusing on the goal, which is to be healthy and fit. Some of us are naturally inclined towards completing whatever it is we've started. For others, finishing can be a problem. Sometimes it's because we enjoy starting new things more than finishing them, and other times the thrill we felt at the beginning has faded, or now we're tired or even bored. When the end is in sight, and we know that our goal will be completed soon, we must ensure that our attention is focused on our goal rather than the current task. When we do this, we re-experience some of the positive emotions we felt at the beginning of our goal, and our awareness of the progress we've made is heightened. Imagine you're that painter again, and that you're on your fifth landscape painting. You're fed up with painting landscapes. And to add to your frustration, you've just won a commission to paint a portrait of a client's son, which you're eager to get started on. Now, rather than focusing on the final painting, you shift your attention to the goal and the chance of being able to present your five paintings to the gallery and the opportunity that this brings of being represented by them. Knowing that you're close to completing your goal makes you feel more positive. You've come a long way especially after the challenge of starting and finishing that first painting. Knowing that in just a few days' time, you'll be able to call the gallery and arrange an appointment for a viewing makes you feel happier and more committed to completing this fifth and final landscape. When we have a task to complete and we procrastinate, we often feel bad about ourselves. And when we feel bad about ourselves, we may carry negative thoughts and feelings such as guilt about the incomplete task. The problem is, having procrastinated once, we're more likely to procrastinate again when attempting the same task, due to the bad thoughts and feelings we now associate with it. Since our natural tendency is to avoid those things that make us feel bad, when faced with the same task, we'll want to avoid the negative feelings and thoughts associated with it, so we procrastinate. Procrastinating makes us feel bad by either reinforcing or increasing our negative thoughts and feelings, and so the cycle continues. This cycle of negativity, feeling bad and avoidance, makes completing the task difficult and in some cases impossible. The only way to break the cycle of procrastination is to forgive ourselves for not completing the task. When we consider that 95% of us procrastinate, that is, it's something that we all do, such behaviour is understandable. Furthermore, when we understand that we continue to procrastinate because we want to avoid the bad feelings we associate with a task, again, such behaviour is understandable, and more importantly, forgivable. So before we can get on with completing the task, we need a way of forgiving ourselves, and then use forgiveness to create action. The loop we create when we continue to procrastinate is a think-feel-do loop, which you'll be familiar with if you've used the Confidence Toolkit. A form of psychotherapy called cognitive behavioural therapy uses this loop to describe how our thinking can affect how we feel, which in turn can affect what we do. The relationship between what we think, feel and do forms what is called a feedback loop. We need to break the current feedback loop by introducing a new thought, which is then followed by a more positive feeling and then finally some productive action involving the task to be completed. What follows is a technique for replacing the current feedback loop with a more beneficial and productive one. Before you can start a new loop, make sure you have everything you need for working on the task in front of you and a way of timing five minutes. You'll also have thought of a reward that you can enjoy as soon as those five minutes are up. When you have prepared what you need, say the following out loud, or if you're in a place where you don't want to be heard, write the following down. You are forgiven for not working on 
and then the name of the task. When you say the words or write them down, imagine you're a child again, and the words you've just said are for you as that child. When you're a child, what kind of feelings might you have felt if someone you loved or respected forgave you instead of telling you off? For this new loop to work, it's not enough to say the words, you have to experience and feel the forgiveness that is associated with them. The next thing to do is smile. It may feel false and strange to do this, but our brains function on the basis that if we do something, this physical action is a consequence of a corresponding feeling, in this case, happiness. Repeat the process. Forgive yourself, then experience the feelings of forgiveness, and then happiness through smiling. Do this three times. After the third repetition, start the task that you've been avoiding, but only spend five minutes on it. Starting the task and then stopping it before completing it uses the first two techniques described in this presentation. Take small steps and stop in the middle of what you're doing. When your five minutes are up, use the technique described in Toolset 1 of Achieving Your Goals to create an implementation intention for when you resume the task. The final thing to do is enjoy your reward. We all procrastinate at some time or another. Use one or a combination of the seven tools described in this toolset to help you overcome your procrastination and to complete those tasks that will help you to realise your goal.